Thanks very much, and hello, everybody. I hope you're still all awake after that fulsome introduction. Um, so it's true, I'm the Chief Executive of the Social Return Investment Network, which is a membership body. We have about six, 700 members, I think, in over 30 countries. It's open to anyone who's interested in this area and this topic. And I think it's probably worth mentioning also that as the one of the directors of FRC, it's a social enterprise. It's based in Liverpool in the UK, and it, it embeds this stuff within it within its thinking. So this is also a practical thing as much as a, a theoretical discussion. So um, in the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to be covering a little bit about social return investment, why you might think it might be useful, uh, what you'd need to do if you're going to if you're going to carry that forward. Um, and what kind, of, what the kind of there's some cultural issues if you if you adopt this these kind of ways of thinking and embed them in organisations which we need to reflect on. Like communication externally to an organisation it has as much value if not more in improving what we do internally and hope I hope that will come through. Now the basic question that we are asking ourselves is 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 how much difference are we making and, and really making? And we would also flip that around a bit and think of it in a slightly different way in terms of how much value are we creating. And I'm afraid also worrying about the risk that we might also be destroying some value as we carry out our work. Well, what we mean by that is that we're thinking about the outcomes experienced by our stakeholders that are a direct result of our activities. Um, and this means that we're not just focusing on the organization's objectives. And I think that's, um, that's pretty important. I think there's a tendency sometimes to think that social return investment or any kind of impact evaluation process is thinking about the organization's objectives and the extent to which they have been met, whereas actually we're saying it's much wider than that. There are all sorts of outcomes um, and they're both positive and negative and we need to be accountable for all of those, but clearly not all of them. Uh, that would be way too much. So immediately we're thinking about what are the important, important ones and we're going to need some kind of process to think through what it does important look like if we're no longer just going to rely on whatever it was that our objectives were. So think through who actually are our stakeholders, and this isn't going to be, as some people sometimes I think, see it as the investors. Equally, it's not going to just be the beneficiaries, as others would, would perceive it. There are a range of people who could be affected by our activities. And so when we say affected, we mean what changes from their point of view. The language I'm sure we're familiar with is around outcomes, but you know, at, its, at its heart, that's a, a story about change. And to what extent are these changes important, because they're not all going to be, and to what extent do they actually result from our activities? And let's not forget that we rather hope that they are of value, and so we need to think about that. And if we're going to move from a situation where we talk about do we do good things, yes, or do we not, no, a binary one, into being able to say how much value do we actually create with the resources at our disposal, we need to get to the heart of that. We need to be able to quantify it more clearly. And I think um, in, in FRC, we're now at the position where we're starting to have a much stronger dialogue with our chief executive management team, where we're saying exactly that. You know, are you really creating as much social value as you can with the resources at your disposal? Sure, if you had more, you could do more. So once we've got all that information, well, we'll be able to do a few things. Obviously, hopefully, we'll be able to get more money. It's obvious, one, obviously one of the reasons why people come to this. They're going, well, we're really fantastic. If we only use this method, which will prove it, um, we'll be able to communicate that to the wider world and we'll get even more money. And that is possible, although I think, as we'll see, there's some steps between uh, analyzing and the money arriving at the door. An important one, I think, is also this idea of that when you go home at the end of the day's work, you have a warm glow in your heart. I think for, for many of us, it, it's difficult always to connect that vision of the organization and the, and the great things we're trying to do, sometimes with the day-to-day -day stuff that we actually have to do between nine and five. And so I think this approach can also help people connect again um, with, their, with the larger vision and mission of their organizations. It is, however, I think also a very helpful to be being more competitive. Again, FRC, we do this stuff because we think we should. We're in, the, you know, we're in the business of changing people's lives, and so it seems morally right that we should be able to say something about that at least. But I'm not sure that that by itself would be enough. We also do this because we strongly believe it gives us a competitive edge. Most of our work comes through contracts, in fact. We're not, um, we're not a big recipient of grants. Um, and so in order to win those, win those contracts, we need to maintain a competitive edge, and this way of thinking clearly helps us do that. Um, at the bottom, and then if not, do more with less. We certainly want to be able to do more with what we have. So if we're going to think all that lot through, our stakeholders, how do they change, and so on, um, 
we're going to need to make a kind of box that we put some mini uh, answer that we can wave around. Um, we're going to have to do some thinking, and we're going to have to make some judgments. And in order to help us think through what those judgments might be, we, we use a series of principles. And we think that the future is going to lie in increasing convergence and consistency around not, uh, not which tool we use, because clearly different situations and different approaches will need different tools, but around the principles that underpin the way in which we think about this wider sense of value that we're talking about. And if any of us worry about um, having to make some judgments, uh, because judgments are another way of thinking about that, is estimates or, um, or assumptions, I'll just wave this short quote from Aristotle at us, um, which I think is important, because I think there's a tendency sometimes to feel that the test of truth in, in impact or social impact is a very high bar, and, it, and we need to recognize that we needn't go further than we have to in order for effectively the decisions that we are trying to make. We just need enough information, and there's nothing wrong with approximations within that, but we need some framework to hang those judgments around so that we can still share and understand what each other are saying. So that's what social return on investment is. Um, I appreciate that for some it feels like it always is seen as an economic evaluation tool, but actually it's really a set of principles that are applied in the framework to help us make better decisions. There's an imperfect world out there and organizations we, we get the best information we can to make better decisions, we hope, hope, so that we can create more value for our stakeholders. That's the plan. So what are these principles? Um, just a quick shoot through on them. There's a lot more detail about these on our website for those who want it. Involving stakeholders. The you know, value is in the eye of the beholder. Value is in the eye of our stakeholders. And I think although you wouldn't necessarily end with the perception of stakeholders, you want to start with their view. They're the people who are being affected by our activities, and they should surely have a say in understanding um, what's happening. And so we need to involve them. And this isn't, therefore, a customer satisfaction approach, which says it more deeply within the process. And this has, um, this has some tensions and difficulties, I guess, because it does involve potentially a transfer of power to other, other groups, and it does involve some time and energy um, to involve people in appropriate ways. What are we involving them for? Well, primarily in order to understand what changes what changes from their point of view is the starting point for an understanding of change. It's not the end point, but it is a fundamental starting point. And we are going to uh, value the things that matter, and we will use financial proxies to do so. Uh, there are various management reasons why that helps, which I hopefully we'll, we'll see a couple of. But behind this, what we're saying is that do not account value of people's experiences on the table in the same language as others are using, then their value will be underrepresented, and there's an increasing risk that we will make some optimal investment decisions as a result of that. So we will get it on the table. We'd love to say that it is able to do is to have reduced inequality and reduced environmental degradation. Certainly that's the underlying heart of what it's about. This is going to be a lot of stuff, then we're going to have to make sure it's only those changes that result from our activities. Where you're working with an organization, people get out of bed to do good things, was involved in that change, you increasingly realize that quite a lot would have happened anyway, even without the organization, and that many others perhaps were necessary parts of creating that value. And that can be done so because we have made judgments, we need to be transparent about that, and because this is a judgment-based system, we believe strongly that there needs to be some appropriate level of external verification of those judgments. And I think um, if you're not a great fan of an audit, and we are sure rather than audit, but if you're not a great fan of that, just imagine what would happen for businesses to have an external audit of their accounts, because those financial accounts are themselves a principle-based approach in which judgments are read It's on the website. You can download it. It doesn't have to perfectly look like that. We, we start to switch a bit from a language of evaluation to a language of forecasting. Uh, we're hoping that we'll be soon getting to the point where in FRC we'll be budgeting the value that we're creating in the same way that we set a financial budget. And like all organizations, so there is a, a risk, at least from a governance point of view, we, we spend more time thinking and talking about the financial aspects than we do thinking about how we can help the organization create more value. By this is that it allows you to put in information systems um, for the future, which will then generate the information you need in order to be able to manage the value you are, you are creating. If you, if you start with an evaluation process, you often run into the problem of not having the right information. I guess inevitably, uh, we, we want to know what changes. We're going to know whether that change has happened and what the value of it is. We will think about the impact by what we mean by crunching, which is the easiest part, really. And uh, we will then use the stuff. And that's fundamental, because if we're, if we're not going to use it to make any different decisions, there is the question of where we started in the first place. So scope, really important. Being clear about who is it for and what is this analysis for is really really fundamental because the amount of energy and effort and time and resource that's required will be determined very much by the purpose and the audience 
to which it's going to be used. We shouldn't do any more than we need to, and I think, again, there's often this temptation to feel that somehow we should in order to prove, or whatever it may be, but we I should always keep at the back of our mind doing the minimum that's necessary. So, so what kind of audiences may there be? Well, at the internal organizational uh, bit, we're thinking about designing better services. You know, how does this information allow us to think through how we have designed the services we offer? and maybe to make decisions on alternatives. At the other end of it, you know, it's a, it's a question perhaps influencing government policy where the level of rigor and the amount of information required will be significantly more detailed and of a higher level altogether. And so that's the kind of range you might find when you're thinking about how much effort it's going to take to apply those principles. So given um, you've got a clear scope, uh, you should be quickly able to sort out who all your stakeholders are. I'm sure we've all done this. Um, <laughs> And the longer you spend, the more you find. Now, just to make one point really for now is that this idea of involving our stakeholders throughout this process is not the same as identifying them. I'm not sure that makes things quite obvious really, but it's worth reiterating. It's for each of those groups. We're not, we don't have a, a, a kind of out to think about different changes that different stakeholders may experience. Now, all the language of this, I'm sure is quite common, whether it's you know, logic models, theories of changes, all these kind of language, but it, at its heart, it's the same, same thing we're thinking about as a result of activity, what has actually changed? And one of the things about this process is that we will we'll often find ourselves realizing that we've missed a stakeholder group out, A, because we find out that that stakeholder doesn't experience any significant change or isn't significantly changing us. And most importantly, we'll be thinking through the need to subdivide stakeholder groups up into smaller categories where we realize that within a, within a group, significantly different changes are being experienced, which therefore we need to manage effectively. So. Let's look at a small example of this. It's people who are at risk from excessive drinking, and they come along to an activity that we're providing to provide advice and support to them. We'll be all familiar with the language of outputs, I'm sure, where we talk about the number of sessions or the number of people that's turned up, but of course that's not really what is important. It's, it's we want to throw it away because we've had some money and we need to show that we have spent it on doing stuff, but what's, hap what's important is what changes as a result of that. And so one would at least hope that some people reduce their alcohol consumption. Now, for some, that might be enough. But if you're involving stakeholders in this conversation, and if you are thinking about this, um, many of us would go, well, but that isn't enough. We need to go further than that. Um, other things will change as a result of that. And there'll be several. I'm just picking one here as an example. But you know, the other blue arrows highlight two things, really. One is that there will be more than one outcome, potentially, from this. And secondly, that this, what we would describe as a chain of events, just keeps going on and on. Some become healthier, and as a result of on, uh, there isn't really an end point to that, how far we will go. And we would be thinking about going far enough that you've answered a so what question, the so what that people have reduced alcohol consumption, but not so far down that chain that people go, there's cliff there is, it's so tenuous that you have now become incredible. And so we have to make avoiding that really. But be careful, again, not to overuse your organization's objectives in determining where to come to rest. If for another reason, then what we've highlighted there is that some people uh, reduce alcohol consumption, and therefore some people do not. And in, in this case, just to make the point, those who do not become depressed. And there's an assumption that kind of sits behind a lot of the time that people who don't achieve the outcome that we may be seeking or that we think happens are no better or worse off than they would have been anyway. And I don't think that's always the case. I mean, we're holding out a sense of hope and opportunity, and if that doesn't come to fruition, people may actually feel more of a failure or less able to manage other issues in their lives than they did beforehand. This is your classic negative and unintended outcome, but really important if we're going to start managing the program. Just think, for example, if um, on reflection as we look at that, we discover that the people who have reduced alcohol consumption have strong family support, and the people that do not have, do not have strong family support, and reflect for a little bit on what that would mean for our service design and or for the type of people that we accepted into, the, into our advice sessions. So we do that for all those stakeholders. We'll think through all those different outcomes, and we'll make sure we've covered it off for all those that are involved. Um, and clearly, you'll see that that means we probably have quite a lot of information, and we'll need to start filtering. Uh, and so we'll be filtering out those that we would describe as not being relevant at this stage. This old materiality, and wherever you, you look at it, is a judgment-based process. If you look it up in the dictionary, I think it says it's a it's a matter of professional judgment. I say it's got accountability, and then we've borrowed that again, I think, really to help think through how we filter out some of the outcomes. Once we've done our initial cut of that, clearly we need to work out whether 
uh, they will happen or whether they have happened and for that we'll need some evidence of that change. Now we, we, we've separated out therefore the thinking about the outcomes, the changes from the indicators and I think it's important to, one of the big dangers I think is of assuming that if, um, if we can't measure it then we'll put it in the too hard box and uh, leave it out. But of course if we've discovered or decided this is an important change and an important outcome then the onus is on us really to find a way of measuring it now. And I think the, the other thing about those um, things we don't measure, we go, well, it's not in our objective, so we don't really need to measure it. And again, if we're going to be accountable for the changes we've, we've created, we need to not overuse our objectives as a filter. So separate them out. Now, for our group of healthier, um, there's all sorts of ways we could get information. We could get information directly from them, um, either by asking them or asking them on a scale or we could get information, or what they do, do differently now, whether they actually, for example, go to the gym more regularly than they used to. Um, or we could get information from third parties, which might be easier or harder, depending on the access and availability of information. Might be able to go to the doctor, find out whether they go more frequently or less frequently, find out about changes in blood pressure. There's a range of different sources, and again, um, the key here is to use the minimum necessary uh, to give you the confidence that you need that the outcome has changed or will change in order for you to make the decisions that you're going to want to make based on that information. And again, there's a temptation to always go, we need more, we need more, and um, hold that back. You need the minimum necessary. And this should also be an opportunity to clear out some of the stuff that you may find you're, you're, creating, you're, you're collecting already. I had an example recently from a colleague in Australia who had done this with an organization and turned out that they were collecting all sorts of other things. And so he was asking, why do you do that? And they were saying, well, because our investor, our funder wants us to maintain that information. So he went up to the funder and asked them um, what they did with that information. And they said, well, they put it in this filing cabinet over here in the corner. And they said, no, 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 what, what do you do? What do you use it for? And they said, no, no, we just leave it there in the filing cabinet. And um, of course, that happens. I think you know, we all are kind of a house clean from time to time. And this can be one way of doing our outcomes. They not. So now we either need to find out systems that we have in place, or we need to forecast the amount of change that we think will happen as a result of the resources that we have. Our, our dis That's fine. Uh, we've got all that, and I think for some people actually we find it's, it's, it's a challenge setting a target about change, not so much about the outputs, but setting a target for how much change we actually think will happen. And yet until we start to do that, it will be, it will be very difficult to actually manage our effectiveness and get better at what it is that we're doing. But the, the key bit here is the question then, well, did it actually result from our activities? Was it down to us? Which we describe as dead weight, but you can talk about this. So along the bottom there we have time and uh, the level of healthiness is things get better and more people are getting healthy and so naturally we're very keen to run out and proclaim the success of our pro program and, our, and the investment that has put the level of changing health in the wider population or more or better in King, we may discover this situation where the wider change is happening at exactly the same rate as it is for our group and the bad news of course here and this is the extreme case is that we have not contributed to change at all it would have all happened anyway um, and to some extent, you know, there will be some of this, and it will again start us thinking, because we'll want to see whether there is anything about the group of people that we're working with. That means we should be better targeting. Again, if we found in that previous example that the people that were doing better the ones with family support, and then we found that everybody with family support did better anyway, then there's not much point us providing support to people who have good and strong family support, because we now have a wealth of evidence which suggests that they don't need our help. And so we're back into thinking about service design. So in order to do that, we're going to need some baselines. We need to know where we start from. We're going to need some benchmarks of some sort to compare with. And we're going to need some trend information. And uh, for some sources of data, this is fine and easy and well and good. And for some, um, it's much harder. But in fact, for some issues, there won't be any at all. And it's a question of starting to think about where we might get that. Um, and that won't be an organization doing that often. And we're finding now that either sector bodies or investors or regional governments or whatever it might be are starting to recognize that we need to have good benchmark data. In the UK, the social impact bonds, uh, it works only because there is access to very good controlled data um, on the level of reoffending in similar groups of people to that at which the bond is being targeted. Um, investing in a project specifically at a community level to generate information to give it a better understanding of what we tell at which you might be able to do that. But the important thing from our point of view is we need to start because we need to see ourselves as organizations operating in some context. Of course, you don't win any prizes for that. 
because that's uncomfortable, and you rush back to your investor and go, actually, do you know what? A lot of what we've been doing would have happened anyway. Is this going to be a conversation clearly that you've changed that you're bringing about? Then this is something that you'll want to know. The most, um, in some ways, interesting bit, I think, however, about this process is the question that it makes us think about, well, who else was involved? Um, and again, uh, if you think about change, from the point of view of your stakeholders, it's not unlikely that you'll start to have to consider a wider change being the important thing for them than that part that you do, and that actually there are others going to be involved in creating that change. And that also, if we're looking at some kind of level of sustainable social change, we need to think about who else is involved within that system, and we need to work with them and develop a shared measurement systems and shared data and actually put some time and energy into making that happen. If we don't, there's a risk that we'll continue to run around doing good things on the ground, but not at a significant level of scale and system to make the difference happen. And I think putting stakeholders at the beginning of that conversation is one way of helping think through who are the other people who should be involved. And that is by no means obvious, and I've been in situations where we've made big involved in that system, and them simply not being the right people. So guys, if we're going to create sustainable change, we need to move to much more systemic approaches involving the right people in the change we're trying to achieve. So the kind of questions that you then might be asking um, which underneath this section are, well, how healthy was were you before you actually started? What about people that are like you? How's that been changing? Importantly, if it did improve, how long did it last? There's no point improving people's health if two weeks later we're all back in old ways. And there very often will be an implication in this approach saying you're going to have to track things for longer than the time that people are with you, and you're going to have to think through how long that should be. Um, in FRC, where we have one of our outcomes is helping long-term people, long-term unemployed people back into employment, we track for 18 months, um, very pragmatic, but we recognize that if we're going to be serious about the change we're creating, we need to have some uh, duration and consistency in how long that happens. And finally then, who else has contributed to the improvement in people's health? So that's all good, we're measuring them, we've worked out how much we think will happen, and we've allowed for what would have happened anyway, and we're starting to recognize that other people would be contributing to those level of changes, so now we're going to value them. Um, so uh, why would we value them? Well, just before we do that, I just want to kind of have a couple of reflections on this, and I'm hoping that somewhere out in this group, and it's you know, always so difficult, you can't see anybody, but there's some of you out there who are wild fans of high-heeled shoes and uh, the kind of brand that goes along with a Ferragamo and we'll be immediately realizing that to get this season's new one of these, we're going to be in the, I don't know, what, thousand, fifteen hundred dollar um, categories for a pair of shoes. However, I suspect that from, for the majority of us, we'd be looking at that thinking, would I ever spend fifteen hundred dollars on a pair of shoes? Not in your life. And so um, the first point in terms of value and what the value is of things as people, and this is a good thing, otherwise we'd all wear exactly the same shoe. Um, and so I think it's good, and I think we need to recognize that also when we think about the value of social outcomes, they will be of different value depending on our stakeholders and the groups that we're working with, and we need to, again, have that at the back of our mind. The other important thing I think here is that for the person who can't wait to get in that pair of shoes and get on out on a Saturday night, um, they're going to be feeling pretty fantastic when they go out. Their self-esteem and confidence are going to be rocking at least until the hill breaks, but let's forget that for a second they'll be feeling good. And um, for those who, who feel concerned that it's very difficult to value things like self-esteem and, and confidence, I think uh, there are businesses out there who do this all the time. What they don't try and do, however, is value it in some kind of average generic sense for everybody. They try and make sure that they value it from the point of view of the group of people who share that value to the even the amount of investment necessary to create value from that point of view. So. Um, Two things, one, value, subjective, ever-changing, socially constructed. The second thing, um, that we can and people do capture the values of intangible things all the time. Um, and of course, we will think they can be made very tangible at the same time. So, uh, that in mind, why would we want to value outcomes? Well, there's the communication piece, because people like that story. There you've got two activities, and we're deciding, well, which one should we do more or less of? If we do not have some frame of reference, very hard to make that, make that choice. And as we'll see, I hope, it's also very important in how we actually think through how we design services in order to create more value. The kind of approaches for those are that sometimes we'll get more money as a result of a very easy source of value. I think for those programs which are often thinking about uh, saving public resources in some way or saving a taxpayer um, some money, we need to be careful because 
what often happens is not that that service actually saves any money, it's simply that there is some spare capacity in it now because we've taken some people out of the system and that that spare capacity will be taken up by others. So there is no real cost saving, but we have freed up resources and that is a value and we should recognize that and maybe the cost of those resources is a good way of representing that value. But often what we're really trying to get at is that there are things that happen for people that change and are of value and we have no real sense of how valuable they are and so that's going to make it hugely difficult as a result of that. Um, but that's what we'll be looking at. Now, um, if we were a little bit thoughtful about why we needed to actually get into the detail of this, think through uh, an example where we have a stakeholder with three outcomes as a result of their project. Now, so, um, that's easy. B and C are other outcomes that happen, and C happens to be negative in their objectives. The Bs and Cs don't even exist, so there's not a big problem. But if they do, and we're thinking about them, I'm sure we'd realize we need more information than that. So we'll have a look at the relative quantities that have been created for those. And good, we're getting our As. There's also lots of Bs, and there's a few Cs. We need to have some waiting for them, so let's value them. Now, we could value them as a proxy at the moment, but if we do use a financial proxy, just as a waiting, we will also be able to use that for those other putting different options. But in this scenario, we've moved from one where, no, it isn't very good at all. In fact, potentially we're destroying value so long as we agree. So it is important to value. Now, there's a range of different ways of doing this. We don't have time to go into the bottom three are um, using language largely, state preference. That's revealing the preference that people have by looking at, um, which relies on quite advanced econometrics, and it relies on national data sets of how things are changing, um, so a number of survey which surveys 15,000 families every year, and this approach allows us to look at how those constituent parts of well-being are changing, and to a way obviously in terms of maintain or attain the same, we will have to think through which is the most appropriate, back to the question of what was our scope, who are we trying to influence, and what is the purpose, yeah. and agree with the approach you use to valuation. The biggest person on this group who agrees that a Ferragamo shoe, pair of shoes is worth $1,500 is enough for us to do a trade assuming I have them and the other person wants them. And the fact that nobody else here agrees with that is not really relevant to our ability to use that valuation. And that exactly the same applies here for the purpose we need. Only those people who are going to be involved in the decision to agree. Having sorted that out, we're back in a position we should be able to filter some stuff out again from a management perspective. There'll be some outcomes now which are potentially of no value, uh, would have happened anyway, and or didn't happen to any great extent, and that is a big clue that maybe they're not significant. Maybe we need, if not to not worry about them, certainly go back to redesign our service so that we can address that. And with those bits in place, we can do a calculation. Uh, the number crunching bit, quantity of the outcomes that we thought were happening or have happened times our financial proxy taking account of these other aspects of attribution and dead weight will give us a value for each outcome for each stakeholder and we can start to use that information because that is just the starting point we've done the analysis we've got to that point from here on in we're using and this is by far the more important and interesting bit as I see where I'm going that, uh, that we need to use the minimum amount of effort depending on our need all those principles um, and that you can't kind of miss out one or if you do miss anything out you're increasing the risk more substantively that you won't know how much difference or value you're creating but nonetheless those principles do not always need to be applied with the same level of rigor so ranging from an internal management team having a planning session through to an external facing public report will have different levels of rigor so let me just get that to go back there this, if nothing else, is really about strategic planning. I think um, it's about thinking about the organization and what it does and where it's going uh, and the extent to which it is creating value or not. So that is the purpose, really, of using this approach, not so much to communicate the wonderful things that we do, but to actually internally think that through at a strategy level and then allow us to manage our activities more effectively. As I already said, we're going to need probably some systems for tracking stakeholders over time, and we're going to need some intermediate measures to think through whether we're on track. We're possibly going to need to go out and hunt for or encourage some research to underpin that story of change for each of our stakeholder groups that we've been thinking about. Um, for most of us, there will be something there already. This is not a case of you know throwing everything out doing already, um, and we'll circle that round. You're doing absolutely everything, but you're not thinking about what would have happened anyway. Just add that bit in. One of the practical manners, and you can play with it to your heart's content, now you can do a sensitivity analysis to look through how sensitive the results are to some of the judgments that you would have made, and that will help you determine 
which things you should do first in terms of implementing new systems. It will help you think through how long should you track for. Uh, so there's a whole range of reasons why it's the perhaps one of the most familiar aspects on this. Um, and the reason we'd be looking at that is um, uh, but it really doesn't mean very much if you just have it by itself, what you resulted in that. How had people thought through those principles? And if I'm going to use it, I'd be wanting to be able to say, well, this is what we thought we were going to create. We said the ratio would be 3 to 1. It turned out it was only 2.6 to 1. Why was that? Uh, was it because we had more people? Was it because they were more difficult to work with? Was it because there were other people involved? Was it because they valued things differently to what we expected? There's a whole set of reasons we can now analyze. We can do the variance analysis of all of which should allow us to reflect back on, our, on what we do and go, well, in that case, we need to do this, that, or the other differently. And at that point, it is useful. But it's not the only way of presenting value. There are many other ways. Um, we've seen people uh, use, I was going to say song and dance, but that's probably a bit extreme, but certainly pie charts and bar graphs. Um, you, know, you, have to, you have to take the analysis you've done and then you have to take it to the audience in the appropriate format. There's no good rushing off using a ratio if the person at the other end is going to go, I just don't get it and I just don't want it. So do think clearly about who you are seeking to influence and involve in that. And of course, get them set up in how we're going to be communicating things right at the beginning it makes it so much easier. But do realize that once you've got an assessment of value, uh, you can divide it by the investment and come up with a ratio. But there are other ways of thinking about it as well. And one of the important ones, I think, is uh, this, you know, recognizing we're going to be using this for service design and thinking this through right uh, internally before we wave anything outside. Uh, and let's look at a specific example. So here again, we have an organization that provides benefits advice to older people. Uh, this means that they'll get some advice, and as a result of that, they'll be able to claim higher levels of social payments or social benefits. Now, that was the objective, and that was being achieved. Um, but the organization started to think this through a little bit more, and, and it turned out by a process involving stakeholders that there was also some improvement in health, and that people also saying they felt less isolated. So we're getting our objective and those others, but remember, we wanted to look at the quantities, and we find we're getting some of all of them. So fantastic. Nothing to do, you'd have thought, potentially, because we're achieving our objective. When we look at the value from the point of view of people, we find out that the reduction in isolation are more valuable than the actual financial gain made from the benefits. And so at this point, we start to have a service design implication because we can either design the service with a row of tables where people sit down as a much more sociable space, market that, um, then at least on, uh, with the information we have at the moment, we'd be able, we hope, to attract far more people into this service and the investor would get far more outcomes that they want and we would create far more value. And all we're really doing is thinking about value from the point of view of our customer. And so really at the heart of this valuation question is thinking things through from the point of view of our beneficiary on whose half we are acting and recognizing that there's more to worry about than simply the objective. And if you only think about your objective, you won't need to do any of this at all. So at this point, then we start to have information that we can compare and contrast, providing the management team and the board all agree with what the valuation processes were. We can start to move resources around internally. We can start to redesign goods and services, what it is that we are doing. More importantly, and more probably than any single other thing, is that we will end up with a much more informed discussion, and we find the ability to think through and communicating. It's really clear about who is it, something around the board, or just one of your groups of people, the analysis information in order to report to other people in appropriate ways. You can hope that we're out there creating value for people, but I'd be interested you know, to reflect on how many of us then think we know how much value we're creating for people, and are therefore in any position to be able to think about how we would increase that, and we need to put that into the kind of internal thinking of our organizations. And in this way, we're getting stakeholders involved in design. By thinking about those potential negatives, we are filtering out and designing ways to minimize them. By recognizing something would have happened anyway, we are differently targeting. If we go back to that, um, the, the, the reducing drinking example, where we had those people with family support, no need to bring them in, it turned out, because they would have been supported anyway. And we had a service where for those people who didn't have family support, we were making them more depressed. The result is that we should go back, they do not have, and stop bringing people in who do have family support because we're wasting money. And so that's quite a fundamental rethink about what it is that we do and the way we, we design if we start thinking about designing around value fit. But is all this going to take? Well, it depends. If uh, you're a complex organization with a really big purpose of changing the world, um, you haven't got a lot of capacity, you've got very few little existing systems, got stakeholders it's hard to access, it's going to be much more expensive than if the reverse of those are true. 
Um, what is a good idea, therefore, is often to kind of plan through and think through what would be involved in order to set a budget um, and to compare really clearly what expected benefits you get. It will take time and resource. The question is, will the benefits that you hope for, will you use it effectively, will they exceed that cost? Um, and if they do or you hope that they will, then you've got a reason to get on with it. All this is made so much more helpful if you have board support. If you're the sole person running back into the organization going, we really should be doing this, and everyone's getting on with their busy lives, you're likely to get much less traction than if the board are saying down to the chief exec, well, how much value are you creating? Show us what you're doing. What was the budget? Let's have a discussion with you. We will back the investment necessary to change systems that follows from this. All that will really help and make it a regular kind of thing rather than simply a one-off exercise. There's plenty of information out there on our website. There, um, there's loads, um, and I would, of course, clearly wish that you would run away immediately and want to become members. But one of the reasons you might think about that is that in the members area, we have a growing and increasing range of um, social return investment work, both which are examples that are out there that we know about, but also examples that we take through our assurance process, which is the assurance of whether people have applied those principles in a reasonable way. And as a membership organization, we're now the members are slowly developing supplements to help guide in other areas than we originally set out in the guide when we did that. One of the areas that I am I'm excited about at the moment is uh, what we've got is a wiki voice, where voice stands for values, outcomes, indicators for stakeholders. I think we've been involved, and I'm sure some of, the, some of you have been involved in um, the discussions about what is the right outcome, what is the right indicator, and there are people out there with databases which have that information on them and which welcome you to send it in. And we've decided to flip that round at the moment and go, well, do you know, we don't have the answer to all those things. The What is changing will be very context specific. Um, actually, we need to have a bottom-up nuanced debate about that. So anybody anywhere in the world can add information to this database and I would re really encourage you to go and add things and if you have comments or questions about it, we respond as quickly as possible can to making changes. But add stuff. There's the opportunity to discuss it in a trip advisor kind of way. And at the back of my mind, I hope that we can start to crowdsource values. So that as we sense of these values which do not exist in markets, get a legitimacy and a commonality by virtue of the fact that lots of people have been involved in using them and or not using them, and that, that becomes the kind of debate that we can legitimize a sense of value in a different way to help us all and make better decisions that do, in the end, tend towards a reduction in equality would be great. So uh, have any questions we can't deal with in the in the further information, do go to WikiVoice and or um, email and ask Nexi, who are on, on the line as well. So thank you very much for listening. Strange as it is to talk to everybody into the, into the ether. Questions? Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you. Um, we are going to move to questions now from the audience, and I do want to remind everyone that there is a question box at the right-hand side of your of your screen that you can type into, and we can we can look at the questions there to, to pass on to Jeremy. Um, our first question was was a logistical question. If this if this PowerPoint was going to be available, it will be available on the Nexi website with the audio uh, of Jeremy speaking. So you'll be able to find it there in in the next week or so. Um, in terms of, of a question to you, Jeremy, um, one of the first question is, is I can see how SROI is flexible and would be good to, to accurately address the concern of comparability that investors seem to have. Yeah. Um, so what, at the moment where you've got a very bottom-up approach and that level of flexibility, there is um, the, the danger of course each. I think that's a necessary starting point is that the range within judgments are being made is assessed towards a shared view of what is a reasonable judgment. Sector bodies who are starting to say, well, why don't we get a lot of organizations in our sector together, they come into the UK. And um, through that process of that power point of view of someone looking at them. However, that said, um, I think that's, that's going to be a journey. Ability. What they're looking for is, is this some who are serious about the change, should and then they're going to invest in it, whether they're serious about managing that change. And so it's not a, even within the investors, it's not a, a one-size-fits-all approach. But you're right, at the moment, um, there is going to be, there is less consistency, uh, and it's not a rating system. And so that for an investor who distinctly wants to just have that, then it's not necessarily going to be appropriate, unless they put a lot of time and energy working into, working in the sectors in which they're investing to, establish some consistency of judgments in the first place. Thank you for that, Jeremy. And speaking of rating systems, what, um, you know, the, the 
well-known rating system, GEARS, um, the Global Impact Investing Rating System. How, how does SROI differ from GEARS and, and potentially IRIS as well? Well, let me deal with the, the easy one first, which is IRIS. Um, we have a partnership agreement with IRIS now, and we're working through the kind of data sharing aspects in terms of WikiVoice. Um, to, to the extent that the RS has information on outcomes on it. We also have a document on their website and our website which explains the relationship, which at its heart goes, social return investment will help you identify what it is that you should be measuring, and it may well be that you'll find an indicator for that on IRIS. Um, but the first question we should be thinking through is what should we be measuring and therefore managing. So that's an easy link. The one with gears, I think, um, has been... Um, not quite bottomed out yet. I'm, I'm, I'm still in the throes of conversations to try and get something agreed, which we could, like we have with ours, have on both websites. However, I think that they're uh, they're, they're complementary because Gears is a is a rating system and it allows you to think through a series of indicators which allow you to compare with other uh, organisations, and that will be of use in some situations. Whereas what we're saying is, well, we need to understand the value being created by those organisations and that in, in inevitably and inherently will be context specific. Um, so it's, it's a bit of, you know, they, I think they can sit alongside, sit alongside each other, but they are different because of the one is, is not saying, it has a, a predetermined fixed list of things that you'd manage, and the other is saying, well, these are the list of indicators that you would put into your rating. Great. Um, and, and next question here is, um, do you have any sample case study reports available that we can see what the final product might look like? And if yes, where can these be accessed? Yes, you can. Um, as I say, there are loads and loads of them. In the members area on our website, which of course um, means you would have to be a member, which is the vast amount of, um, I think it would be about 80 US, it's 50 sterling plus VAT, that kind of amount, so it's not huge. There are a couple of organizations we are trying to encourage involvement and, part, and, the, and the sustainability, and so most of that information that we have available at the moment is on the members area. Of course, if you Google SRI, you will find quite a lot anyway, but if you want a kind of body of work that, that gives you a fuller picture, then that's where that would be. Okay, great. And you mentioned a bit about the cost of, of being able to access those. I have a question here of about how much does it typically cost to implement SROI, if it's possible <laughs> to give an answer to that. And it's, is this a one-off cost, or is it yeah. incurred on an ongoing basis? So there's two bits to that, really. One is um, it's not possible to answer that. Um, and just to be a bit unfair, but to give an example of imagine a, a very large organization with no financial accounting system asking how much it would cost to implement a financial accounting system. It would be very difficult to say that in advance. Um, and there is, there is a capital bit because there's a kind of in th thinking it through and then designing and implementing the system, and then there's the running cost of collecting information from that if you're going to make use of it and embed it. So they are two different things. Actually, I think that often the thinking this bit through at the level that's appropriate for you is not the resource intake, and it's difficult to say in advance, but it's potentially the implementation of change. New systems, uh, even to the extent of thinking about appraisal of stock um, uh, type organization, all these require time and energy. Um, so as a complete... Uh, avoidance of the answer because it's too difficult to know in advance exactly. Um, I haven't. Yep. <laughs> that was SROI in a for-profit context. We invest in businesses like agribusiness and artisanal companies yeah. that may or may not consider themselves social enterprises. Do you have any advice on using SROI in this context? Um, well, the same principles absolutely apply. There's no difference. I think there has. Uh, you know, social return investment started with it in the social enterprise world to some extent, I think, because they were organizations that, that got out of bed in order to create social value. But actually, all, all businesses create social value uh, and maybe destroy it as well, but, you know, um, and, and it's a source of information that can help both create more value and also manage risks within businesses. There are not a huge number of examples of businesses that have been doing that. Over the past six months, there has been, however, a lot more, a lot more specific, particularly with some of the corporates. Um, um, I think the kind of one that's a, that was I, I don't know the details, but it was around on the on the, uh, in the media was Pepsi uh, and using social return investment as part of supply chain thinking. So there has been a growth, but there's you know it's it's a cross sectoral approach. It just says if you apply these principles, you will understand the value of the changes that you are creating, which are not being captured at the moment within your profit and loss or income and expenditure accounts. 
Okay, great. And we have a, a fairly specific question here. Um, in in a really pragmatic sense, other than the the wiki voice, um, is there another place to to find proxies to use? Uh, yes, Google. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, and, and you know, so for some of them, they will be very specific. So I'm thinking if I'm looking for the proxies of what health service costs are in the UK um, for different levels of service provision from the perspective of the government as a stakeholder, then there's a specific database which is, exists or information which is done every year which talks to that. Um, and there will be other sources for other situations. There will be increasing numbers of examples of work where people have done something similar if you search for it. A lot of that is academic. And where it is going to be you actually having to engage with your stakeholders, there may be less out there. You may be the first, be the first to do it. And I think in this case, you should consider yourself more as the as the entrepreneur with the new the new product that you're taking to market, and be bold and you know and say, well, this is what we think the value is. There is more and more information becoming available, uh, so it's a bit of digging and a bit of a bit of peering around will find some, and that's one of the reasons why we're you know why Wiki Voice we think is important, but generally to create spaces where we share more information. I think one of the challenges in this area is that we don't share enough. You know, we know lots of reports and analyses that are done, but then they are kept within the organization. Of course, that means that none of the rest of us can see what others have done and learn from that and share from it. It's getting much better, though. Great. And I'm going to ask one last question and looking at the time here, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, it's, it's a bit about how do you really get at the outcome and, and evaluating from the input. So the question here is measuring input by the number of, let's say, advice meetings, for example, is it not also important to measure the quality of each meeting? And how does SROI do that? Well, it's, yes, quality. Um, so there's two bits of that, I think. One is the one is the the quality is, in, to some extent, what happens as a result of that. So we've measured the activity, but you know, did it make a difference? Um, and what difference did it make? And was that a value? All the things that I have been talking about are implicitly about the quality of that. But there is the other one, which you may be referring to, which is then, well, um, what about the actual quality of the the way the advice was given or where that support was given? And again, I'm hoping that in the conversation we've had, uh, some of the things we're flagging up show how this thinking will cycle back around, making you think, well, maybe we should be delivering a service in a different way. Maybe the way we're delivering it isn't creating as much value as we should, or it's not working for a particular group of people, or whatever it might be, and that will force a reflection. That won't answer the quality of the service, but it should help say, actually, this is what we need to be looking at again. Um, but no, it, it's not about then saying, well, exactly what would we do to improve the service? That's the next step, which is down to you and the, you and the team. Great. Well, these have been some great questions that, that you all have sent through, so thank you. Uh, if we didn't get to your question today, um, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, email. please email me. Send. Yeah. Email Jeremy, and, and you're also free to send them to, to Nexi's contact information as well. Um, lastly, you know, I'd like to thank Jeremy again, and thank you all for your participation, and we look forward to having you on future webinars. Have a great day. Thank you very much.